So with that, let's go ahead and let's kick off our first session today. So we are going to be introducing the team from Breaking Bourbon. I'm going to go ahead and add them to the stream here real quick. So what you're seeing here, we've got the three or should I should say the trio. We have Jordan, Nick and Eric from Breaking Bourbon. These also are good members of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. We have them on podcasts that we do every three weeks. So you go ahead and check that out as well. With that, I'm going to hand it over to you guys and let you take it away. Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Kenny. And welcome to all of the viewers at home. My name is Jordan Moskal, and I'm one of the three co-founders of Breaking Bourbon. And if you don't know what Breaking Bourbon is, we're the world's number one bourbon website. You can go there to find reviews, articles, release calendars, when bourbons are coming out, right? We really try and make it as easy and accessible for anybody on their bourbon stage to learn more about bourbon and learn more about the whiskeys they might pass on the shelf. And we're really thrilled to kick off her the first ever Whiskey From Home today. So today what we're gonna be talking about during our session is how well do you know bourbon? So over the next 30 minutes, we'll be going over bourbon basics to more advanced technical and historical knowledge, along with discussing common topics to find out what's real and what's myth. And as Kenny had mentioned today, right, it's the Kentucky Derby. It's noon on a Saturday. It's supposed to be Derby Day. It was canceled. So, so instead you're here, you're at, hopefully I'm on your couch, right? You have a bottle in hand, you're watching a virtual whiskey conference, right? Well, it's never too early in our book to pour bourbon, right? Invite a friend virtually to join us and have a little fun. So I'm going to open up a bottle of Weller Special Reserve to kick things off. I'm going to pour a little for myself. And then you know what? I have two of my really good friends and co-founders with me too. I'm going to pass on over to them. Oh, oh. Didn't expect that, buddy, but thank you. I uh, appreciate that, that magical handoff through the internet. So my name is Nick. I'm one of the other uh, guys, the co-founders of Breaking Bourbon. So I'm going to go ahead and have a pour here. This is my first pour of the day. And I think uh, Derby Day, watching Whiskey from Home, certainly a good excuse to uh, to join us on this. And, and happy to be here, excited to be here in front of all y'all today. So I'm going to pass it to the third guy. I'm going to give him a warning, though. So incoming, coming your way. Hey, Whoa. thanks for the upgrade. <laughs> I'm Eric. I'm another uh, co-founder of Breaking Bourbon. I'm um, happy to be here today. And if you haven't noticed, I'm the beardiest of the three members. And i like to thank Quarantine for that. Um, so back to you, Jordan. All right. Thanks, guys. So, you know, as I mentioned, one of the reasons Whiskey From Home is taking place today, right, is traditionally today is the day of the running of the Kentucky Derby. And this annual event usually takes place in May. It's been postponed until September. But it still, you know, represents, it represents May. It represents spring coming, you know, and going and it represents somewhere a step closer. More so it represents bourbon, right? You can't have the Kentucky Derby without bourbon. And of course, when you think of bourbon and you think of the Kentucky Derby, you think of mint juleps. Now, the mint juleps are very serious business over Derby weekend at Churchill Downs, right? So the running of the Oaks that takes place on Friday and the running of Kentucky Derby on Saturday. As many of you probably assume, there's a lot of mint juleps, right, consumed at Churchill Downs, but I'm not sure if you know how many there actually are that are sold. And if you guessed over 100,000 right now, you'd be correct. There's actually 120,000 mint juleps sold every Derby weekend. And mint juleps are usually, you know, they're made with um, a pre-made mint julep mix, and that represents those 120,000 represent 10,000 bottles, right, of pre-made Old Forester mint julep um, mix. Now that's a lot of bourbon to go through. Now mint julep at Churchill Downs, if you haven't been there, usually costs about $15. And for a pre-mixed cocktail, you know, you're probably thinking to yourself, that's pretty pricey. And you know what, you're not wrong, but it's also not the priciest mint julep you can actually get at Churchill Downs. So Woodford Reserve sells a $1,000 and $2,500 mint julep that's served in silver and gold mint julep cups. Now the proceeds go to charity, but no matter how you cut it, you would never look at an expensive cocktail again after seeing one of these bad boys poured. All right, so that's a, that's enough little fun facts. You know, I think really what we're here to do is we're really here to learn about um, the world of bourbon. It's full of misconceptions, it's full of myths, it's full of fun facts. And I think you can't know any of those until you start knowing some bourbon 101. So I'm gonna pass on to Nick, who's gonna break down some of those myths and facts for you. Uh, thanks, Jordan. All right, guys. So if uh, any of you guys follow us already, uh, you probably know that we put out a, a, a quiz earlier this week that was kind of leading up to this event. And if you didn't take the quiz, 
that's okay. We're going to talk about it. You didn't need to have taken it uh, to watch today. You can go back and, and take another time if you like to. If you did, we released your scores uh, to email. So we had about 900 people take the quiz. We had two people that actually got all 14 questions right. So that kind of tells you how difficult we made this quiz, and that was deliberate. And the first three questions, we actually made the most difficult, very tricky questions. We're going to get into those. So what we're going to talk about today, what I'm going to talk about, and it'll weave in through this whole segment, is first a little bit of history, and then we're going to talk about kind of bourbons today. What is bourbon? Bourbon, straight bourbon, bottle and bond bourbon, kind of get into those classifications. So let's talk about some history first. And I'm going to tell you, this is, when I say cliff notes, this is like the, the little tiny notepad, a little tiny sticky note of quick cliff notes. I'm going to give you a real tiny little bit. There is so much more information out there. I encourage you to read books, the internet, uh, archive newspapers, whatever you can get your hands on. It's really fun, uh, interesting history about bourbon. So as the story goes, this, uh, this Baptist preacher by the name of Elijah Craig invented bourbon, and he's called the father of bourbon. Well, you know what? That maybe isn't so true. Now, granted, there's a brand called Elijah Craig. It's uh, put out by Heaven Hill. It's a great brand. That's a story that, uh, you know, some people choose to believe, but there's maybe something that's a little more uh, believable, maybe a little more uh, widespread. And that's the idea that bourbon was really kind of created by a lot of people uh, almost simultaneously. And, and it's kind of built in these early days of of people settling in the United States of America. And so, you know, back in those in those days in the 1700s, there were, you know, all these farmers, people were farming their land, they had to feed themselves, they had to feed their families, and they had excess crops. Okay, and so what do they do with those crops? Oftentimes, they distilled them into what would eventually become whiskey, basically. And corn was one of those excess crops. So this is all going on with all these farm distillers who are making whiskey for themselves. And so as we look at where these people are, where they settled, they were a lot in the Northeast, you know, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and eventually kind of moved into the Kentucky region where we end up having this, uh, this, this section of, of land uh, that was once Virginia uh, called uh, Bourbon County, Kentucky. And actually in those days, that was a much bigger Bourbon County, Kentucky than it is uh, today. And it's now referred to as, as Old Bourbon County because it's not what you know, Bourbon County is today. And so that was going on there. So there's a little bit of talk of maybe the name bourbon kind of originates from that. And there's actually a little more talk that maybe it originates from somewhere else more specifically. So what's going on? People are making this on farms. Uh, the limestone water there is fantastic. It, it promotes fermentation for them to use. It filters impurities like iron, which are, are not good in whiskey. And so they're making this and everyone's storing everything in barrels because that's just what you did. There were coopers everywhere. This is a trade that goes back uh, over 4,000 years. And so eventually trade opens up and we have these steamboats moving down the Ohio River and down the Mississippi River and eventually ending up in New Orleans, Louisiana. And lo and behold, there's a street in New Orleans that's also named Bourbon Street, as it turns out. And so Bourbon Street has a lot of these establishments where people can drink these, these drinks. And so at one time it was brandy, but this, this, this whiskey that's coming down from up north, that's a little bit cheaper and it tastes somewhat similar. So people start drinking that. And as it turns out, as they're drinking it, these people start referencing this and saying, how about that that bourbon whiskey? They're referring to that, that whiskey they drank on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. And this is now spreading back up into the north. So there's a belief that the name actually originates from there. And so we're gonna fast forward a little bit. It's still not officially named. This is now just kind of a general term people are using. And we fast forward a bit, and eventually in the 1800s, it does become officially named. And then if we, as we get into the late 1800s, we get this act called the Bottle and Bond Act, where we start to see some laws surrounding this and other spirits. And finally, uh, before we transition, I'm going to leave you with the, the day that uh, the U.S. declared it a distinctive product of the United States. So we said, hey, bourbon, this is ours. We claimed it. Okay, and actually the anniversary of that is two days from now, May 4th. Uh, so it was May 4th, 1964, the United States said, bourbon, we're claiming it. And they kind of tasked, the U.S. Congress tasked all these U.S. agencies to go and do their due diligence to make sure bourbon was American. And so we bring it to today, and we're going to talk a little bit in a few minutes about, you know, what these different classifications are of spirits and that kind of thing. But before we do that, I want to uh, pass it back to Eric 
because as we think about kind of bourbons today, as I pass that Weller to him, somehow through the, the magic of the internet, it transformed into a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle, a bottle that many people know, and that has been hyped up pretty excessively. And I've even heard the term, I've heard that it's so, uh, it, it, Pappy is so hard to get that even billionaires can't buy it. So Eric, tell us about that. Shed some light on that for us. Yeah, so that that's a myth we've heard for many many years now, and it is a myth. It's not true, and but it's it's also kind of a lot of fun to say and and to hear, and that's why it gets passed along. But um, you know, and that myth kind of came along almost during the last ten years during the bourbon boom, when Pappy kind of became more well known, more in demand. There just weren't as many limited editions, so it just kind of gravitated towards that's what everybody wanted. Um, but you'd be surprised that stores get a lot more pappy than you know most people realize. In fact, they tend to get more pappy than you know, like a if you pick any limited edition in a given year, they'll get more pappy. Um, the difference is, is demand. There's just so much more demand for pappy than there is you know any other given limited edition that it's just the supply just can't you know meet the demand. Um, it doesn't hurt that Pappy's also really, really good, you know, and that just fuels that reputation it has and why everyone wants it. Um, but also Pappy isn't unattainable, you know, it's hard to get sure, but it's not unattainable. And, you know, when people ask us friends and what we've written on the website about, um, you know, tips about how, how to try and, you know, get yourself a bottle, um, you know, the, the first thing we don't want you to do, or don't, you know, don't call a store and think, you know, every store in town and think you're going to get a bottle of, you know, the owner's going to be like, all right, yeah, I got a bottle for you. Come on down. You know, it, it's probably not going to happen. Um, you know, what we suggest is, you know, pick a store in your in your in your town that you know gets pappy. Um, get to know the owner. You know, introduce yourself. Go down there, um, and buy all your bourbon from that store all the time. You know, every time you're in there, say hi to the, to the people that work there, to the owners. You know, and eventually you'll you'll become friends with the owners and the people that you know that work there. Um, you know, store owners want the bottles going to you know, a good home. They, they want it to go into lo their loyal customers. They don't want to immediately sell that bottle and it goes on the secondary market. It's not what they want. Um, other things you can do is follow a store on social media. And a lot of times they'll, they do events, they do tastings, they'll do private barrels, you know, all that stuff, you know, that they, they want interactions with their customers and that stuff you can do. Um, you know, all this, it sounds like a lot of work and it, it is, but you know, so you, you don't need to be a billionaire and you, don't need to spend thousands of dollars per se. Um, just of course, no guarantee you're going to get one. But you know, following these kind of tips, you know, it's worked for us, and I, I it should work for you too. Um, so we're talking about Pappy, and we know Pappy is a bourbon. Uh, it's a straight bourbon, but it's not a bottle and bond bourbon. Uh, Nick, can you kind of go through those terms and explain what that means? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Eric. So, um, so th these were actually the first three questions on the quiz, on the quiz that we had put out. Uh, we we posed a question about what is bourbon, uh, specifically straight bourbon, and then more specifically bottle and bond bourbon. And and I'm going to talk about bourbon and straight bourbons first, and then we'll kind of jump back to bottle and bond uh, towards the end of the show. But when we think of these three classifications, it's it's, it's very legal. You know, these are very legally defined what these are. Uh, but then all this kind of transitions to what's in the bottles, you know, that are behind me, and what's in the bottles at the store that you're buying, and what are these people making? So we kind of have this level of bourbon straight bourbon and then bottle and bond bourbon and bottle and bond actually applies to other things too but we're going to be specifically talking bourbon so let's let's kick it off with with what is bourbon and we're going to build off of that um and, and there's a lot of misconceptions here so let's kind of go through the kind of hit list of what are the things that make something bourbon so first and foremost it's whiskey produced in the united states so I remember I referenced that uh, Congress had said, this is ours. Okay, it's whiskey produced in the United States. A lot of it comes from Kentucky. The estimate is around 95% of the volume of it comes from Kentucky, so to speak, but it can come from anywhere. It can come from Alaska, Hawaii, even uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, those places. That all counts. That can be bourbon so long as it meets the other requirements. So what else? has to be made from a fermented mash of no less than 51% corn. That's pretty well common knowledge out there at this point. Um, corn is plentiful, that's a rule. Uh, now we're gonna get a little more technical. It has to be distilled when they distill this alcohol, you know, when they distill this, this mash, has to be distilled in no more than 160 proof. There's a cap on that. There's a reason there's a cap on that. It's not say distilled as high as like 
vodka or something like that. They want to make sure they're leaving in some of those things that are going to contribute to the flavor profile and that kind of thing as the bourbon becomes bourbon, you know, at a later point. And so next, it has to be aged in a new charred oak container. Okay. And it has to go into that container at no more than 125 proof. So wait a second, came off the still at as much as 160 proof could be lower, but as much as that. Now they have to probably add water to it before it goes into this new charred oak container. And now that new charred oak container, that can actually be anything. That doesn't have to be a barrel, but turns out barrels pretty pretty great invention. So yeah, it's it's typically a barrel. And a common misconception, and I think it's more because companies advertise this a lot, is it doesn't have to be American oak. It can it's just oak. Um, but you see that that word American in a lot of the marketing that's out there. So that's the next thing. So finally, uh, there is no or a couple more things. There's no minimum age requirement. So as soon as this distillate touches the inside of this of this barrel or this chart oak, this new chart oak container, it becomes bourbon. That second it touches it. If it's aged for a minute, they, they can call it bourbon if they want to. Okay. So no age requirement for bourbon. When they bottle it, it has to be bottled at, at, at least 80 proof. It can be bottled at a higher proof than that. And this is very important for bourbon. You can't add anything to it other than water. And this is different from a lot of other uh, whiskeys out there that can have this small amount of things that are going to flavor it or color it or they're just blend it in. And then these producers don't tell you about that. They don't want you to know it's been adulterated. They want you to think it's pure and that kind of thing. Bourbon, it has to be pure. It's very important. Okay. So now we, we kind of know what, what bourbon is. And I've got a, an example of a bourbon here. This is a, a local bourbon uh, from a local distillery. And this was aged for 12 months. Okay. So I right, said, so there's no age requirement. Uh, for bourbon, but now we're going to step it up to straight bourbon. So now we're going to make the level a little bit higher and straight bourbon really adds two things to that. The first is it says it has to be aged at least two years. And this is probably where that misconception of bourbon's minimum age requirement of two years comes from. It's specifically straight bourbon that has this minimum age requirement of two years. Additionally, straight bourbon has to be the product. Everything inside a bottle has to originate from the same state. So you cannot take bourbon from Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana, and blend it together and call it straight bourbon. Now that those three bourbons could be straight ahead of time, but once you put them together, they're not straight. Everything in Kentucky, you take a bunch of bourbons from different distilleries, put them together, they're all from Kentucky, they qualify for the other things, you can call it straight. Here's one from Four Roses, for example. They distill all of this, of course, um, but they actually blend in another, a number of different recipes together and it's straight bourbon. So great bourbon, four rows of small batch select. And uh, you kind of think about straight bourbons, that's predominantly what you tend to see because that's a lot of what's coming out of these major Kentucky distilleries. And a lot of it is uh, four years old or more. Uh, so you don't see a required age statement. So they're really only putting age statements on if they want to. So I'm gonna amp it up to bottle and bond in a couple minutes. But before that, I want to kind of shift to a different topic. And you guys see these bottles behind me. There's more bottles over here. I'm actually in my basement, and that's where all my bottles are. I store them here for a very specific reason. And there's questions we get asked a lot about this. And I'll pass it to Jordan to tell you exactly why we do that. Hey Jordan, I, I don't. I think you might be on mute there. Right? Yeah, mute there, Jordan. Thanks, there we go. Sorry, sorry. So, um, you know, a lot of people ask us when we uh, go to the site. A lot of people say, "Hey, is there a right way or wrong way to drink or to store your bourbon?" Right? They might be starting off on the bourbon journey, or they might not be. And uh, either way, they're really curious, right? They might have come from drinking other spirits or drinking wine, right? Where a lot of the times they're storing bottles on their side. And you know what? There actually is a right way to store your bottle of bourbon, and that's upright, right? A lot of bourbon, some may come in metal caps, some may come with synthetic corks, but a majority of bourbon comes with a real cork. And due to its higher alcohol percentage, especially those that start creeping up, you know, barrel proof um, over 120, 130, 140, right? That high alcohol contact, that'll start eating away at that cork. And that will, in, you know, it's not going to dissolve it like acid, but it will start eating away slowly and it will impact the flavor profile of your bourbon. 
right? And you'll start seeing leaks and other things. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to keep the cork wet like you would with a bottle of wine. It's the exact opposite. You want to keep it upright, right? Along with that, what we ended up doing was figuring out where's the best place to store your bourbon. So we actually ran a two-year experiment over two years on the site. And what we ended up doing was we had some control bottles and then we had all these other bottles that we stored in various conditions, right? So we had bottles getting direct sunlight, non-direct sunlight. We had bottles being stored in the fridge, being stored out of the fridge, et cetera. And one of the main takeaways that we ended up finding from this storage experiment, right? And you can read all the details. It's really long. We did six month updates every, you know, six months over two years. But one of the main takeaways is that sunlight, it turns out, is the mortal enemy of bourbon. So storing your bourbon in an amber bottle helps. However, most bourbon comes in clear bottles. And truth be told, sunlight will impact um, the flavor of your bourbon. So a lot of us like to display their prized bottle right front and center. You might have a lot or you might only have one. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you're going to be displaying it, make sure you're displaying it someplace that isn't super hot, right? And especially someplace that's not getting direct sunlight. Because sunlight really will hurt that bourbon. So the most ideal place to store it is going to be in your basement, right? So store your bourbon in your basement. It's kind of controlled, right, for the most part. No sunlight usually, right? Humidity is good. Everything's good. And that's the best place to store it. If you can't store it there or if you don't have a basement, that's okay too. A cupboard or just someplace that's not getting direct sunlight. And really when you think about that though, think about all the times you might have walked by a liquor store and saw a really fun bottle in the window. Right? Maybe it was an everyday bottle. Maybe it was something really special that you're trying to save up for. So when that takes place, you might want to give yourself just a little bit of pause and think to yourself, "All right, I want this bottle, but I wonder how long it's been sitting there in the sun." So before you, you know, before you go buy that bottle, you might want to ask the store owner just casually, "Hey, I see you had that bottle out there. Have you had it for a while?" If they say, "Oh yeah, that's been sitting there a long time," you might want to pass or ask if they have something underneath the counter of the same kind instead because you don't know how long it's been sitting in the sun and you definitely don't want to drop money on something really expensive that might, you know, have tainted flavor due to that natural sunlight. So that's just some really quick fun tips on how to store bourbon. Like I said, we ran a really in-depth two-year experiment. Um, you can find out all the results, all the details if you're really into the science of things on the website. But the main takeaway, avoid sun like it's the plague. Now, I'm gonna turn it back over to Nick because I think one of the funnest topics in all of bourbon is bottled and bond, right? It's something that everyone gets a fair shot at creating, right? It's one rule set and it's a way that distillers can really measure themselves against each other, which you don't find too often in the world of spirits. So Nick, you wanna talk about some common myths and common facts when it comes to bottled and bond? Yeah, thanks, Jordan. So the, hopefully all you guys watching, agree that uh talking about bottled and bond is a fun topic um again we're we're digging deep into the kind of the the uh technicalities of, of what this is but what's really interesting about bottled and bond is it actually probably affects a lot of things even w well beyond bourbon um so as it turns out uh how this came to be was back in the 1800s as you know the america became more industrious and, and people started you know looking at how do i how do i sell something to somebody else and, and create value and wealth for myself and things of that nature uh you had of course uh whiskey uh trade going on and so you had people that were you know were selling typically a lot of times barrels of, of whiskey and, and that kind of thing and so what was happening was uh, was, was shortcuts. So not surprisingly, uh, a whiskey or a bourbon uh, that was, you know, darker in color that appeared to be aged longer, that tasted better, whatever, would be more valuable. Um, so what did people do? Well, they, they sped that up by adding things to it. And there was really nothing stopping them from doing this. And so what do they, what do they add to it? Well, they added whatever they could get their hands on pretty much. Um, so back in those times, you didn't, you didn't go on Amazon and, and, and order, you know, whatever you wanted and have it delivered on your prime day. If you're into that kind of thing, um, instead you just got whatever was available, whatever you could afford. And sometimes they included things like iodine, tobacco, all kinds of other substances that could be harmful, deadly, whatever. Right. So so people recognize this and said, this is hurting the industry. It's hurting people, et cetera. We need to put a stop to this. And so this is what, how the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897 uh, came to be. OK. And like I said, it doesn't just apply to bourbon. It applies to other things as well. But we're keeping this discussion specifically about bourbon and talking about some highlights. So this, as it turns out, was the first uh, consumer protection uh, act 
in the United States. So this actually led the way for a lot of other, you know, consumer protections that are there. That's why I said it affects a lot of other things beyond just bourbon. And it turns out that Colonel Edmund Haynes Taylor Jr. And so I've got a bottle of uh, Colonel E.H. Taylor small batch here. This is bottle and bond bourbon uh, as an example, was one of the people that was a very big proponent of this act. OK, so let's talk a little bit about what that makes, what, what specifically bottle and bond. Uh, so now we've got we've got bourbon, we've got straight bourbon. Now we're going to go up one more level. So for bottle and bond bourbon, it must be the product of a single distillation season, one single distiller at a single distillery. OK, there's two distillation seasons in a year, the spring season and the fall season. So it has to be one of those seasons, one distiller, one distillery. That's pretty specific has to be aged in a federally bonded warehouse under U.S. government supervision. Again, I want to make sure that no one's putting stuff in it. They shouldn't. It has to be aged for at least four years. So now bourbon, no minimum age requirement. Straight bourbon, two years. Bottle and bond, four years. We've upped the ante. It has to be bottled at exactly 100 proof. Now, some people think at least 100 proof. It's exactly 100 proof. So if you see a bottle of bottle and bond, it's 100 proof. Finally, the label has to clearly identify the distillery where it's distilled and where it was bottled if, if different. So we, if we look at these labels, we actually learn a lot about is it bourbon, straight bourbon, bottle and bond bourbon, for example. And the labels, labels tell a lot of that story. And so we can learn a lot from that. OK, so now we've we've got this this highest level of, you know, kind of uh, certainty as to what's inside the bottle. So as you're you know, as you're looking at bottles on the shelves. And that kind of thing, you know, bottles you have at home, bottles the next time you go to the store, study them a little bit, figure out what is it? What's what's actually inside this bottle? The labels tell the story. I will say the labels are not always correct. There's actually a lot of labels out there that are not legally correct. And that happens. And you'll find them. You'll see them as you start digging. Um, but as we think about all these, these bourbons, there's so many things being released. This is something we identified years ago. And I'm going to shift it over to Eric, who was really the guy behind uh, what we put together on the site many years ago called the Bourbon and American Whiskey Release Calendar, because we get a lot of questions about this as people are trying to understand all these things coming out all the time. So Eric's going to talk a little bit about some of those questions uh, and address those right now. So go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so we kind of created the release calendar as just a, a way of people knowing when a bourbon was coming out because there was it was during a time where there was a lot more releases coming out and there just really wasn't a good place to know, all right, when are, when is the stuff coming out? Um, you know, but bourbon is not like other products that come out like, you know, movies in a movie theater or books, m music, stuff like that, that actually has a release day and then everybody in the country can go to their store or online and download it. Uh, bourbon is luckily if they have a release month, lucky. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the three tier system where you have the distilleries, distributors, uh, and the stores. And then you also have really a fourth person or fourth entity, the States, which really muck up the whole situation. Um, all this affects when a bourbon is going to get released. Um, and alcohol has so many regulations versus like a book. Uh, so all that can change when a bourbon is released. Um, for instance, and in, in my state, New York, uh, it's not always the case, but a lot of times Wild Turkey Four Roses releases, we can get those six months after the official release from the, from the, um, the distillery. Um, we're also in a state with New York City, so New York City, New York City will get their bottles first or their allocation first from the distributors. They might take it all up and then we get almost nothing up here or don't get it at all. I mean, that happens plenty of times with um, Old Forester Birthday Bourbon. Um, most years we don't even get it, you know. So the, the calendar is a guideline for people to see, all right, this is when it's getting released officially from the distillery. Um, we kind of put all that information together and then it helps people to kind of look out in their own town uh, to see if it's out yet, talk to the people, you know, the, the store owners kind of get a feel for when they think it's going to come out because they're the ones also talking to distributors. It's, it's you know, it goes like this. Um, you know, on top of this, bourbon's already really hard to find. And now you're also dealing with when is it actually coming out? So we're, we're just trying to help that you know, a little bit. Um, and uh, this is all very frustrating, I think, for, for bourbon drinkers. Um, but, you know, part of the hunt, the hunt is kind of part of the fun, I guess we say. But, you know, that's up to you. And you can talk about that in the comments. Great. Thanks, Eric. And that's going to wrap up our How Well Do You Know Bourbon session, right? We just really touched upon just a little bit of um, what you can learn, right? So we encourage you to continue that conversation, right? Go to breakingbourbon.com, 
right? Read more about these about these experiments we've done about bottled and bond. Check out our release calendar, right? Um, learn more about how to join our award-winning single barrel club, right? Additionally, you can also take that quiz that Nick talked about. We had over 900 respondents so far, right? And we thank you for taking that ahead of time, especially number 525 who won our prize pack. Um, and really, right, make sure you're following the conversation along with us. So you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Breaking Bourbon, right? And we really want to thank you for taking time out of your day to just learn a little bit more about bourbon, um, the myths, the facts, and uh, take a moment to have a sip with us. So until next time, cheers, guys. Awesome. Cheers, Good guys. Job. Thanks so there's, a, there's a few few comments that rolled in. So Dan asks, mm -hmm. he's got 350 bottles in a bar, but he gets a little bit of indirect sunlight. Is that okay? So if you're gonna have sunlight hitting bottles, indirect's better than direct. Ideally, you'd get them out of sunlight or find some sort of covering for them, but indirect's better than direct if you have to live with it. And then there's another one from uh, the great Elmer T. Lee. Oh. Graced, our, graced our presence today, but he wants to kind of know about like tipping a cork, right? You know, we, we have a, yeah. you don't wanna, you don't want a cork to dry out. Kind of any thoughts on that? Yeah. Actually, that's that's something I've noticed. I do have a few bottles that um, the cork gets kind of loose over time. Um, I have a bottle of I actually whistle pig boss hog. I noticed it was like the first boss hog release for whatever reason. That cork gets loose constantly. I'm actually deliberately going in and I have a lot of bottles open. I'm tipping it, moving around a little bit just to wet the cork, get the cork to expand. I've also noticed that if you have an empty bottle and you just leave it empty, leave the cork in there, eventually that evaporates out. And I've even had bottles where the cork just becomes completely loose, just taking it out. So if you don't have a little moisture in there or something going on, some moisture on the cork, that can happen. Well, fantastic. Well, guys from Breaking Bourbon, thank you again for that awesome session. I'm sure that people are... Uh, they're getting really schooled right now. So make sure you go and check them out. All their socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, breakingbourbon.com. Go and follow them. Cheers, guys. Appreciate it. Great session. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, Thanks Kenny. Kenny. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead.